Hello and welcome everyone. On behalf of the National Eczema Association, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, Feeling Triggered, Diagnostic and Treatment Challenges of Eczema. I'm Carrie Gauthier, Director of Marketing and Communications. We see the people are still logging on, so I wanna give them a few minutes to join us. While we wait, I want to make sure you know about all of the wonderful upcoming events here at NIA. On May 9th, we are looking forward to our next webinar, More Than Just a Rash, Eczema's Related Conditions with Dr. Jonathan Spurgel. On June 13th, Dr. Lisa Meltzer will be presenting Exhausted, the Impact of Eczema on Sleep. And in July, Dr. Peter Leo will be coming back with a webinar on other eczemas beyond atopic dermatitis. And of course, our big event that is coming up is the Eczema Expo, June 21st through 24th. We will have a wonderful welcome reception and registration on Thursday the 21st and jump straight into sessions on Friday the 22nd going until midday on Sunday the 24th. We will have presentations from world-renowned experts on all the topics that you can possibly think of around eczema and health and lifestyle opportunities to chat about how to support your health with diet or exercise. And of course, the best practices on treatments, topicals, systemics, you name it. So we hope everyone will come and join us. You can see more at eczemaexpo.org. And I will say this again at the end, but for those of you watching tonight, we want to offer you a special discount of $40 off if you register in the next 24 hours. And the code is, oh, excuse me, by the end of the weekend, not 24 hours. You have all the way until Sunday. Um, the code is TRIGGER, T-R-I-G-G-E-R. -G -G -E and that will get you $40 off your registration. So definitely go ahead and take advantage of that. That's the best available price out there. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. For those of you who just joined, welcome. I'm Carrie Gauthier, the Director of Marketing and Communications here at National Eczema Association. I'd like to welcome you to Nia's webinar, Feeling Triggered, Diagnostic, and Treatment Challenges of Eczema. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared with all attendees within the week. So look in your email. We usually get it out even faster. <clears throat> the National Eczema Association is a national patient-oriented organization which is governed by a board of directors and guided by a scientific advisory committee comprised of physicians, nurses, and scientists who volunteer their time and expertise. We work to improve the health and quality of life for individuals with eczema through research, support, and education. I'd like to thank our webinar sponsors, and forgive me, we have not added their logo here, but it will be added to our recording. Um, Sanofi Regeneron, Sanofi Genzyme Regeneron, excuse me, has generously supported our entire webinar series for the year. So uh, while the content is completely controlled by Nia, their support has underwritten our ability to produce these very helpful and wonderfully educational sessions. So thank you to Sanofi Genzyme Regeneron. All right, tonight's presenter is Dr. Rupam Brar, who is a pediatric allergist and immunologist and associate professor. Did I get that right? Associate assistant, assistant <laughs> professor at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado in the division of pediatric allergy and immunology. As a parent of a child with allergies and asthma, she understands the stresses of managing these conditions. Dr. Brar implements a holistic approach to managing AD, incorporating skin care, diet, behavior modifications, and avoidance of allergens. So she really gets it. And having seen her presentation before, I promise you're gonna get so much out of it. She really, really does understand as both a physician and a parent. Dr. Brar will present for approximately 30 to 50 minutes. Please use the questions section to the right of your screen to send us questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, we will have a short two minutes for additional questions to be submitted. 
Dr. Barr will answer as many questions as time allows after her presentation. Um, for those of you who are watching from a mobile device, please know that you can see both the presenter or the slides. Unfortunately, the uh, software does not allow you to watch both at the same time. So if you only see one or the other, you can swipe between your screens to see, um, to go back and forth between them. And with that, I will pass this off to Dr. Farr. Fantastic. Give us a moment while we get all of the slides set up. The joys of technology, right? <laughs> can you can you see my slides? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so I am so delighted to present to you guys the diagnostic and treatment challenges in eczema. Here are my conflicts. And I'm going to start with an illustrative case. We have a 16-year-old male. He's admitted to the Eczema Day program at National Jewish for re-evaluation and management of his atopic dermatitis, allergic rhinitis, and asthma. Prior to admission, he reports that his skin became increasingly difficult to treat, particularly in the past year. He's saying he's having severe pain with baths, wraps, and application of any cream. He's complaining of facial pain due to dried, cracked lips. On exam, he's noted to have fissuring around his mouth and swelling around the eyelids. His body reveals dry and very bright red skin with signs of scratching. He's also noted to have flaking on his lateral eyebrows and scalp, the lateral eyebrows being the outer part of the eyebrows. So this is a picture of our young man. This was taken at home. This was taken in our day unit. So you can see, um, because he has a brown skin tone, um, the erythema, the redness, it appears violaceous, almost purple. Um, he's got a lot of open areas, um, also pigmentary changes, probably from a lot of use of steroids. And here on his neck, he's got thick plaques, and then those thick plaques are also on his lips and at the corners of his mouth. So this is a pretty typical patient for me. Why is this young man so severe? Does he have the wrong diagnosis? Does he have a concomitant diagnosis? Is there something else occurring along with the eczema? Is he colonized with MRSA or just Staph aureus? And why has he worsened on therapeutics that previously worked? So we have some answers, possibly. Could he be allergic to steroids? Um, atopic dermatitis may be a risk factor for contact allergy. This can be due to a skin barrier. Um, that impaired skin barrier, it allows for increased irritation and allergen exposure. Also, he's used a lot of topical products. I have patients that come to me with garbage bags full of products they've tried before. So with all that exposure, and especially going back to infancy, there's opportunities for sensitization to occur. Steroid resistance. Those that are colonized with staph are at risk for steroid resistance. Does he have steroid addiction? Um, this is also known as topical corticosteroid withdrawal. How can these challenges be managed? So just FYI, our patient was colonized with MRSA um, along with his entire family. So we did incorporate that in his management, but we also considered changes in his skincare regimen um, and recommended emollients and topical corticosteroids that did not have suspected allergens and irritants. So differential diagnosis, um, my focus for this talk will be atopic dermatitis, which is a subset of eczema, um, but there's a broad differential here. So always make sure you have the right diagnosis. If it's in question, a skin biopsy is recommended or you know, a second opinion. Um, immunodeficiencies, metabolic diseases, skin cancers, um, severe infections and the associated dermatitises that are associated with those can look like eczema along with psoriasis and dermatitis herpetiformis 
which is due to gluten intolerance. For this talk, I'm going to focus on these two chronic dermatoses, which is contact dermatitis and seborrheic dermatitis. So key diagnostic features of atopic dermatitis. Intense pruritus, this is the itching that keeps you up at night. This is the itch that rashes. And that chronic eczema typically presents in an age-related fashion with infants having bright red plaques on the cheeks um, and also on the face, as well as the forearms and the tops of the knees and legs, um, in the elbow creases and the backs of the knees for older children and adults. Um, there's usually sparing of the groin and underarm because those are moist areas. And adults, we can also see head and neck involvement. An important feature that's seen in most cases, but of course not all, um, is an early age of onset, um, A to P, so accompanying allergies, including food allergies, um, a history of allergic rhinitis, skin tests that are positive, elevated IgEs. Um, and these can be very markedly elevated in patients with eczema, um, along with dry, itchy skin. So glossary, these are some of the terms that I hope to cover during this talk. So concomitant diagnosis, this is occurring at the same time, and it may be secondary to the main diagnosis. In the case of our patient with um, the scaling in the eyebrows, He's having seborrheic dermatitis occurring at the same time as his atopic dermatitis. Contact dermatitis. This is inflammation of the skin due to an outside exposure. Steroid allergy. This is dermatitis that's caused by the allergy to steroid or worsened by the use of the steroid. Steroid resistance is failure of the AD to improve either with highly potent topical corticosteroids or prolonged use of mid-potency corticosteroids. What would be defined as prolonged use? Do you have kind of an approximate time frame? So I was expecting that question. Um, and it's not well defined and there's no consistent definition. However, for me personally, um, because we do have this day program at National Jewish um, that implements occlusion therapy, wet wrap therapy with baths, if someone is not improving after two weeks of three times daily baths, I consider that a steroid resistant patient. So for me, those two weeks should give me a sense of whether they're responders or non-responders. And the majority of patients I see are responders, but I would say about 10% fall in this non-responder category, this resistant category. Great, thank you. Um, sometimes when I get a history of someone who is seemingly steroid resistant, I try to implement a strategy um, just off the bat, not waiting until the end of the wet wraps, to um, kind of address that steroid resistance. And I can talk about some of that. Um, steroid withdrawal, which is also called steroid addiction, typically has symptoms of burning, stinging, pruritus, pain, um, intolerance of emollients. Sounds a lot like our patient. Um, this is often on the face and genital area, um, and it's higher predilection in adult women, not as common in children. So seborrheic dermatitis uh, has a bimodal distribution. And what that means is that it occurs in two time intervals in life, typically in babies, um, and then again later in adolescents and adults. Um, reason for that is because of hormone stimulation of the sebaceous glands. Mm -hmm. So babies will have hormonal stimulation from the mother. Um, adolescents have sebarchy, which is the onset of sebum production. Um, this has a different distribution than atopic dermatitis typically on the scalp, um, the eyebrows, the nasal labial folds, which is that area around the nose and the ears. And it has a little bit of a different appearance than atopic dermatitis. Um, there's more of a yellow flakiness and a greasy scale rather than that pink dryness um, that we can see with atopic dermatitis. Here is an example of a baby with seborrheic dermatitis. Um, so here in babies, we often see a seborrheic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis overlap. Um, so I think the picture cuts out the cheeks a bit, but you can see here there is probably some atopic dermatitis, but then you also have the seborrheic dermatitis. So I will typically manage both conditions when I'm treating infants. Contact dermatitis. So this can fall into two categories. This is allergic contact dermatitis or irritant contact dermatitis. And you can have an increased risk of contact dermatitis in atopic dermatitis 
though I will say the data is conflicting. Some studies suggest it may be even less. Some studies say it's no more than the general population. Other studies say it is more than the general population. However, in my experience, you do want to consider contact dermatitis in cases of atopic dermatitis that are severe, where a patient is refractory and worsened by topical corticosteroids, when flares are occurring with use of certain topical products, even if that product is something that seems to work for everybody else because you know everyone is unique. Um, if the distribution of the atopic dermatitis is atypical, if there's an occupational exposure, um, healthcare worker that's washing their hands a lot, someone who works in a nail salon, hairdresser, um, and then if I see very severe hand or eyelid eczema. So the diagnosis of contact dermatitis is typically made by patch testing. So a subset of contact dermatitis that I want to focus on is corticosteroid allergy. So you want to suspect this when a dermatitis is unresponsive or worsened by use of corticosteroids. This affects as little as 0.5 to up to 6% of suspected allergic contact dermatitis patients. And cortisol is a really ideal contact allergen. It's highly lipophilic and gets absorbed through the stratum corneum, that top layer of skin, very easily because of its low molecular weight. And then once it's in the skin, it can actually metabolize and form an allergen um, by getting hydrolyzed. So that allergen is called steroid glyoxal. So yes, topical corticosteroids themselves are not allergens, but can easily be converted to them um, depending on which, which steroid you're using. So most common steroid allergens, this is based on patch testing. Um, Tixacortol is what we use for patch testing. That is a marker for over-the-counter hydrocortisone, budesonide, and hydrocortisone 17-butyrate. So corticosteroid allergy um, has been identified and it's been classified as well. So there are um, five classes um, in the Koopman classification. This is based on molecular structure. Um, so this is not a comprehensive list by any means, um, but does include some of the main um, steroids to be aware of in each class. Class C is the least allergenic. Um, so if you are suspecting corticosteroid allergy, this would be a class to try. Um, class, A, oops, class A and budesonide are cross-reactive with class two. Um, and there's also an alternative classification. That's the big classification, which actually will combine groups. It combines um, a, B, and D2. Another allergy to be aware of is allergy to the excipients in the corticosteroid. So this is allergy to the product and not the corticosteroid itself. I suspect that this is something that we see more than we realize. Um, excipients are inactive substances. They often make the drug more biologically available, which is why they are used with the corticosteroid to help it get incorporated into the skin. Um, so it can be part of the vehicle and they can vary with the vehicle. So an allergen may be present in a lotion or cream, but not be present in the ointment. Um, excipients that are common to corticosteroids, and this is not a comprehensive list, but it does include the top allergens, um, is propylene glycol, lanolin, and sorbitan sesquialate. Um, there are also preservatives that are found in corticosteroids. These include parabens and formaldehyde-releasing preservatives. I am going to focus on excipient allergy. So propylene glycol, it's a vehicle that has humectant properties. It's very good at absorbing water, which is why it's found in so many moisturizers and topical products. It's the most common allergen in topical corticosteroids. Um, in one study, it was found in 68% of topical corticosteroids, um, and it can also serve as a preservative in foods. Um, it's in ice cream, frostings, box cake mixes, salad dressings, food coloring, Entenmann's cakes. Um, here is a list of topical corticosteroids um, that we developed and adapted from a previous study done in 1991 of corticosteroids that are available without propylene glycol. So I would like to show you that this list illustrates that there are still options if for someone who suspects that they have a propylene glycol allergy. Um, in terms of therapeutics. Um, propylene glycol. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Um, you mentioned that this is found in a lot of food items as well. 
if someone's discovered that they are reacting topically, should they be avoiding it to ingest as well? Is that a common link or not necessarily? So ingestion that results in dermatitis, that's called systemic contact dermatitis. I do not typically recommend avoiding oral um, foods that contain propylene glycol um, because I think that it becomes restrictive on the patient. Um, but I do have patients that elect to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that eliminating those foods is not difficult because it's typically processed foods. Um, and I think you guys will talk in the Eczema Expo about things like diet, but I'll, you know, I'm sure that processed foods can't help in a situation like this. Um, I, but I would not make that pan recommendation if someone was allergic to propylene glycol. Um, so it doesn't translate to a food allergy just because you have a topical allergy or a food sensitivity necessarily. So it wouldn't translate to a food allergy or food sensitivity causing um, gastrointestinal symptoms. The thought is, is that the ingestion could result in systemic symptoms. And the systemic symptoms would be a body-wide or severe rash. Um, so that's where I would take the clinical history kind of judiciously. Mm -hmm. So if someone says, you know, my skin was doing great, and then we went to a birthday party and ate donuts, and maybe then, and then her skin broke out in a rash and it's bright red, and I saw them in clinic for that rash, and I agree that it's, you know, much more severe than what they started with, then I might, and I know they have a propylene glycol allergy, then I might say, yeah. I think it's a good idea to avoid those processed foods that contain propylene glycol. Um, but again, I, I'm always in favor of keeping the diet open and not being restrictive because I think that, you know, it's hard if with to add food allergies to a list of skin allergies. Definitely. Thank you. No problem. Um, I did want to add to so propylene glycol. Um, Apart from being a contact allergen, it's also an irritant um, and it can cause significant burning and stinging. So a lot of products that do contain propylene glycol will have that side effect of burning and stinging. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Because of that, in patch testing propylene glycol, we often run into difficulties where it's difficult to discern whether um, a reaction is an irritant reaction because of the irritating nature. Um, of the propylene glycol or whether it's an allergic reaction um, because someone is truly sensitized to it. Um, lanolin is another excipient. So this is wool alcohols. Um, it's made from sheep sebum. It's found in aquaphor um, and it's also found in some topical corticosteroids. Um, and again, if I mention something that's containing something, I will put the onus um, on you guys to always investigate yourself because ingredients are constantly changing um, and always check the package insert if you're not sure. Sorbitan sesquialate. Um, so this is an excipient that's found in 28% of topical corticosteroids. Um, it's cross-reacted with polysorbates and sorbitan monosterate. Um, it's not a common contact allergen, um, not tested in most standard allergen series. Um, in one study that was done at Mayo Clinic, it only affected about 0.8% on patch testing. So though I list it, um, I actually don't worry about this as an allergy as much. Steroid resistance. Um, so I define this as failure to respond to highly potent topical corticosteroids or failure to respond to prolonged treatment with mid-potency topical corticosteroids, which we can loosely define as two to four weeks. Um, depending on if occlusion was used or not. Um, asthma patients with atopic dermatitis who are colonized with staph aureus will require higher doses of inhaled corticosteroids to control their symptoms. What this tells us is that patients who are colonized with staph have increased insensitivity um, to corticosteroids. Um, this has also been shown that those have, who have staph aureus, their T cells also have more insensitivity to corticosteroids. Um, this may be due to super antigens. Um, Staph aureus has a number of associated super antigens that can directly activate the immune system. Um, and you can sometimes overcome this inflammation that they directly cause um, by using a topical calcineurin inhibitor, which would have an anti-inflammatory benefit without using that glucocorticoid receptor. Steroid withdrawal, steroid addiction. 
Um, so the National Eczema Association con conducted a systematic review of the literature um, to investigate this issue further because there is extensive interest. Um, so there in their um, study, which was published in the JAD in 2015, they define it as a skin eruption that accompanies topical corticosteroid use. And it often worsens after topical corticosteroid discontinuation um, and requiring elevated doses or increased applications of topical corticosteroids to prevent the recurrence of that skin eruption. This skin eruption is often localized to the application site. Um, so the rash is happening where the steroids are applied. Um, and you can often see resolution after discontinuation of the corticosteroid. Um, there are some caveats. The literature that's existing, um, there's no specified timeline for when this worsening happens. Um, and there's no specification of what potency of topical corticosteroid is used. I do often see patients that come to me saying that the steroids are making them worse or they got worse on the steroid. But um, when I discuss this with them, you know, that topical steroid that they were prescribed is not strong enough for the severity of their underlying eczema. Um, and also patch testing was not performed. So it's possible that these patients that are getting labeled as steroid addiction or steroid withdrawal perhaps are worsening because they actually have a steroid allergy. Symptoms of steroid withdrawal or addiction are burning, stinging, um, worsening with heat and sun, um, pruritus, pain, facial hot flashes, and they identify two subtypes of steroid addiction, um, the papillopustular group and the erythroedematous group. So the papillopustular group is really more of an acneiform um, kind of dermatitis. Um, there's pustules, papules, nodules, whereas the erythroedematous group is more this desquamating, peeling, red, scaling, um, swelling associated rash. Um, this can often be on the face and neck. So here is a Venn diagram that sort of identifies that there is quite a bit of overlap. You have steroid allergy, steroid resistance, steroid addiction, and then in the middle is severe AD. And this is kind of where it falls, where, um, you know, because of staff, there may be resistance. Um, because of sensitive skin, there may be you know, allergies or irritants. Um, and then there may be this component of steroid addiction or steroid withdrawal. Um, my approach is to try to do almost like a skin reset where I can get it better with topical corticosteroids um, because they do remain the mainstay and number one choice of treatment for atopic dermatitis and try my best to transition patients to a non-steroidal option, which is a topical calcineurin inhibitor, a PDE4 inhibitor, um, and um, or even considering like wet wraps occlusion therapy with emollients that I consider effective. So take home points from this. Consider a concomitant diagnosis. Modify the skincare if contact allergies or steroid withdrawal is suspected. Um, we talked about some of these options, such as occlusion therapy, topical calcineurin inhibitors, changing or discontinuing the topical corticosteroid, um, sometimes switching the class, um, or just changing a brand name, changing from cream to ointment. Those are modifications that can make a difference. Adding on treatment for seborrheic dermatitis, considering patch testing. Patch testing um, does require bathing to stop for at least 48 hours. Um, and it also requires a clear back. So if you don't have a clear back, um, it's very difficult to perform patch testing. Um, so just those are the caveats for patch testing. Um, and culture the skin or nares to evaluate for skin infection or colonization, particularly with staph areas. And then if all else fails, there are biologics that um, are now available and more coming in the pipeline. Um, as well as other therapeutics that will offer us additional therapeutic options. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, 
would you talk a little bit more about the patch testing? I know that that's obviously a really important part of the um, process of determining if there's a contact dermatitis happening or not. Sure. Um, so patch testing, um, there are different ways to go about it. Um, one can use a standard panel of allergens. Um, there's the true test, um, there's the North American series, and those often are you know, just standard allergens that are selected. Um, I'm usually in favor of also adding onto that thin chambers um, where we patch test the patient's personal products. Um, so whatever it is that they're using, um, patch testing those. Um, I take it to the level of, especially for my young women, including their cosmetics, um, because those can often be a hidden source of contact dermatitis. Um, and what that typically involves is um, on a clean back that actually has not been moisturized that morning, um, <laughs> because that will make it very hard for patches to stick and I've run into that problem, um, where you place the allergens um, and they're pretty extensively taped on um, and left on for 48 hours, removed at 48 hours, and then at the site of each kind of allergen, it's like a little square, um, we look for a reaction. Um, and then interpretation is also done at 72 hours um, and can also be done at 96 hours. Um, and for topical corticosteroids, um, reading can even be done at seven days. Um, so, Bathing has to be stopped for at least the first 48 hours, um, or patients should not be, um, you know, playing soccer or you know, going to CrossFit because all those things would interfere with the patches staying in place. And if they sweat, the patches could fall off. And you know, it should be a meaningful test for the patient. So if you know they're going to go back to the doctor three times in one week, um, it's really important to follow instructions. Um, also, if someone's treated with um, you know, oral immunosuppressants, so cyclosporin, prednisone, um, those can interfere with patch test results. So um, it's important to discuss that with the doctor before doing patch testing um, because those could potentially suppress any patch test positivity. Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, wonderfully educational and informative presentation. We're gonna move on to our question and answer portion. A lot of great questions have already come in. Um, we will take the next two minutes to receive additional questions for Dr. Brar. So if you haven't already, please go ahead and submit your questions now. While we're not able to get into every question, um, we will select the most frequently asked um, from today and any clarification we can look for. So while we wait for those questions to come in, I'm gonna thank our sponsors again, Sanofi Genzyme Regeneron. Thank you for supporting the Webinar Wednesday series this year. Um, we couldn't do it without the support of our partners. And I do wanna encourage you all to get involved with the National Eczema Association and help raise awareness about this disease. There are a lot of ways you can get involved. You can become a NIA ambassador sharing your eczema journey in writing or in person, working in grassroots adv advocacy, getting um, better access to care, joining our online support group Eczema Wise, and more. You can attend events. As I said before, register today for Eczema Expo, our patient conference and kids camp. You can bring the kids along with you. Um, any kid who will be five by the end of the year, all the way up to 17, we have a under 12 camp and 11 to 17 teen camp. So we'll meet the needs of everyone. Even your surly teenagers can join us happily. We promise we will not baby them, but they'll get to be with other kids who have eczema and understand. And for the adults, you get to be around other people who, who get it as well. And it's truly a life-changing experience for everyone involved. And again, um, we will give you a $40 off if you use the code TRIGGER, T-R-I-G-G-E-R, before the end of the weekend, that's through April 29th. Um, and you can check out the agenda, the speakers, and all of the associated lifestyle activities that we will be exploring on eczemaexpo.org. And of course, you can donate. 
As a 501c3 nonprofit, our work relies on the support of our community. So let's move on to the questions. Um, you know, before I move on to the actual written questions that I've already received, you mentioned cosmetics. This is such a common question. We get it all the time. What do you tell women who come in and say, Dr. Brar, I want to wear makeup, but I have eczema on my face. What do I do? How do you guide them? What can you, what tips can you give? Um, so patch testing helps because it helps me identify which ingredients they need to avoid. Um, I will suggest certain brands, um, which if you're okay with me naming brands that I recommend. Um, Absolutely, uh, this isn't an endorsement or anything. Um, this is just from Dr. Barr's experience and we always encourage you to do a small test on your skin before you use anything, um, but please share whatever information you have. So I often recommend Bare Minerals. Um, and also beauty counter products. So those are the two that I recommend for patients. Um, yeah. And any other tips in terms of, um, you know, other than obviously avoiding things you've been patch tested and identified, but if let's say they've done that and they're still struggling or, um, you know, they don't have any known allergies or reactions from patch testing, um, is there a best practice um, to trial and error the best product for you that you would advise? Um, so actually, I really like, um, there's another website that I really like, the Environmental Working Group. Um, they have a product finder, um, and it's really more intended to identify things that are um, cancer causing or bad for the environment. But not surprisingly, um, those things often go hand in hand with things that also irritate the skin. Um, and so you can actually look up individual products on that website um, and it will tell you if it contains ingredients and if those ingredients have any particular side effects and they'll list things like if it causes skin irritation. Mm. Um, that said, um, I'm always in favor of if your skin looks good, you don't even need makeup. So, um, and I, and I, I'm in favor of things like oils. Um, so it's kind of nice now, a lot of skin care, skin care is focused on using like facial oils, um, which is a practice that, you know, was, I grew up with, because that's like something that Indian parents do with their kids is massage them with oil. Um, so I think it's actually nice that um, you know, a lot of the products are actually focused on kind of having clean ingredients um, and avoiding a lot of chemicals. Um, so that's what I would recommend. Wonderful. And just so you know, we don't have cosmetics, at least not yet. I don't know if that's going to be on the horizon or not, but um, we do have the sale of acceptance, which is for at least moisturizers and cleansers and household products. And the exciting news is in the not too distant future, we have an updated directory coming where you'll be able to search by ingredient as well. You'll be able to exclude for things you're allergic to or include if you want something. So we're going to be able to offer that for our um, eczema community as well. So that's mm -hmm. really exciting. exciting. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, so this is a good question. You mentioned um, for seborrheic dermatitis that mm -hmm. the common times where you'd see it would be in babies and um, puberty pretty much or older mm -hmm. adults, right? Yeah. Where there's a hormonal change. So um, are there any studies where, you know, you'd see a change, maybe there's an increased pregnancy, menopause, um, different hormonal times in women's lives? I would, I would expect that in pregnancy, a woman could perhaps experience worsening of seborrheic dermatitis. I would expect in menopause, the opposite would happen um, because there's less hormones after menopause. Sure. Um, so yeah, that would, that would seem logical that seborrheic dermatitis would get worse with pregnancy. No, no studies that you know of though? Nothing that I know of offhand, okay. sorry. Um, anything between estrogen specifically and eczema? Um, so I think that's 
like an area of controversy. There's all these studies about like estrogen and progesterone related dermatitis. Um, and, you know, people do skin testing with progesterone, um, but it's not a standardized practice. Sure. Yeah. Um, is patch testing the only definitive way to diagnose um, contact dermatitis? This comes from a 56 year old female who's been diagnosed in the last year with allergies. No cream has helped, probably seven different ones, keeps getting worse, started on fingers and now is on arms and neck. So patch testing can be negative, but if someone has a strongly suspected contact dermatitis, I will often tell them to avoid the ingredients regardless, um, because it's not positive in all situations. Um, it's not 100%. Um, and also, if um, someone does not want to go through with patch testing and going to their doctor and getting tests done, you know, for the three visits, um, you can always um, do a repeated open application test um, on yourself with the product. Um, the suggested areas are either on the elbow or behind the ear. Um, to test a product and if you see um, inflammation or dermatitis erupt in those areas and that's not a product that's safe to use mm -hmm. um, and i would apply that and then evaluate the next day not the same day uh sure I've never seen this question before so i'm going to ask it can contact dermatitis in the ear cause excess earwax? I would imagine that it would not cause excess earwax. Um, but I guess if there's dryness and the wax, is the wax you know, is a compensatory response to that dryness, it would make sense. You get increased oil production in response to that dryness created by the contact dermatitis. Mm -hmm. um, but no Q-tips in the ears. <laughs> That's a hard and fast rule. No, no Q-tips in the ears. <laughs> um, we have a question from a new nurse practitioner working in primary care. Um, and she's wondering what your favorite resources for treating eczema are and when is a biopsy warranted? My favorite resources for treating in terms of topical, I'm guessing she means like topical treatments or... Uh, yeah, well, that's not clear. So may, maybe just when is a biopsy warranted? <laughs> okay. Um, so biopsy, I think, would be warranted if um, the diagnosis is in question, um, if distribution is not typical. Um, you know, we talked about how you see creases um, often involved in um, adolescents and adults. But if I see an extensor where it's the tops of the elbows instead of the inside of the elbows, I um, might want to consider something like dermatitis or pediformis. Um, and if something is happening suddenly um, in an age where it's not typical, like if an adult were to suddenly present um, with a bright red scaling rash, um, in that situation, you would want to make sure that it's not, you know, a skin cancer like CTCL. Um, so those are situations where um, a biopsy would be warranted. Um, in the pediatric population, sometimes um, when they first present, you can kind of see this eczema psoriasis overlap. Um, and later it can declare itself um, a little better. Um, so that, that's another situation where a biopsy may be helpful. Hmm. Lots of questions that I'm sorting through here for you. <laughs> um, So this person is an adult and has been, has severe reactions to most topical steroids, um, although they are, they're still waiting for their patch test results, so that's just presumed. Their scalp is severely dry and itchy. Um, they have discovered that they're allergic to Class C and propylene glycol. So knowing all of that, any suggestions for treatment? Um, Calcineurin inhibitors. Um... For the scalp, if they can't use topical steroids, then oils, um, and some oils are better than others. Um, sunflower oil is considered anti-inflammatory, um, so that's a good oil to try. Um, 
And with the topical calcineurin inhibitors, um, pimacrolimus works well for mild to moderate eczema, often on the head and neck, um, but tacrolimus is probably what would be needed if it's a more severe eczema. Um, with the caveat that um, it can sting, um, and you know, for people who have a lot of open lesions, um, that can be difficult. Um, dupilumab also. Um, Thing to consider if your you know severe and topicals aren't working um, because that if it was an adult patient that is something that would be available to an adult um, mm -hmm. who has reasons to not use other medications um, or an oral immunosuppressant if insurance coverage is an issue um, those are the patients that we do consider you know more severe um, escalation of therapy mm -hmm. so that is that um I'm sort of wondering about a, a patient journey where you do find someone who has several proven reactions to common uh, topicals, you would then move to the TCIs or something and sort of what's what's the time frame or, or milestones where you would be looking to level up um, to something else? So um, my typical patient that I see in the eczema day program at National Jewish um, may come in with a story like that 16-year-old boy who was described. Um, and in him, I might use something like triamcinolone um, ointment, which is in just a petrolatum base. Um, and I would combine it with wet wrap therapy. Um, or if I felt like I needed something more severe, something like a flucinolone ointment, um, which is also in just a petrolatum base, doesn't have a lot of excipients. Um, and I would try that. Um, I would culture for staff, um, treat with oral antibiotics um, if necessary, um, because treating the staff can help overcome that steroid resistance. Um, and then once their skin is not open, not oozing, um, a little more um, healed, if you will, um, then I would then at that point this is that probably after two weeks of wet reps transition to a topical calcineurin inhibitor. Uh -huh. um, and then that's sort of my typical timeline patient that I see. Um, and if they're not responding to that topical calcineurin inhibitor, um, my, my next step would be then to start, you know, doing paperwork um, for escalation of therapy. And the problem with, um, the problem with oral immunosuppressants is they have a lot of side effects. So, you know, before dupixent was approved, we did have patients we were using them on, and I was seeing um, people develop nephrotoxicity problems with their kidneys, um, having families come in every two weeks for blood pressure checks um, and blood work, which is really stressful, um, especially like if you're dealing with a young child to get so many frequent blood draws, you know, and because they have eczema, they already have sensory issues because they're constantly triggered with the itching and the pain. So that's challenging. Um, so, um, you know, I, I empathize with that struggle. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my timeline is I, I, we always start with the wet wraps um, and then and consider other options when that doesn't work. Sure. Yeah. Um. So you very clearly um, laid out, and I'm thank you so much. The um, the three kind of big areas where you've got steroid allergy, steroid resistance, and steroid addiction or withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, in your experience, is there any markers or flags where you could um, help differentiate between those or is it really just coming down to the patch testing and trial and error and location of um, the rash? It, it's the latter. I, we don't have good biomarkers right now um, other than maybe eosinophils, um, but that's not specific. It wouldn't be specific for steroid allergy versus steroid withdrawal. Um, I think the clinical history is really important. Um, situations like this but you know a lot of our patients have this history of like yes i've tried this 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 i've been on prednisone 
X amount of times, oral antibiotics X amount of times. So it is hard to tease out, um, you know, which of those categories they fall into. Um, the fact that they overlap um, and the fact that treatment strategies for all three of them are really similar, I think is what's more important to focus on. Um, you know, there is an overlap um, in um, symptoms of redness, for example, and scaling in staph infection and steroid addiction. Um, and I can't, there's no direct treatment for steroid addiction, but there is a treatment for infection. Um, so I do start with that. Um, and there is therapeutic alternatives to steroids. Mm -hmm. Um, you and I had the opportunity to have a little bit of an exchange I'm, and I'm bringing this up because there's a very, very long question that came in specific to, uh, topical steroid withdrawal. So I'm trying to get at the meat of the question. Um, so we had the opportunity to talk a little bit back and forth about that. Um, this particular person, their, their primary question is how do you get a doctor to accept that there's really such a thing as topical care, corticoid steroid withdrawal? Um, so just from Nia's perspective, we did do, um, some research, we gathered a task force and they did an educational review of the literature. So, um, for those of you watching, if that's something you believe that you have, uh, from what I'm hearing, I think Dr. Brar would recommend patch testing first and foremost to make sure that it's not an allergy, um, and looking at the possibility of resistance that do you really just need a higher one? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then if you still do those things and you still think that this is a possibility, because we do, we, we have identified that it is an, um, its own entity, it is real, um, bring them the literature. You can uh, get it on the NEA website and um, it's readily available to whoever needs it. So, um, you know, I, I, I would love your input as a doctor. Um, when someone comes in and says, this is what I have, because I know that as patient advocacy, we, we definitely live on both sides of the fence and hear both sides of the story. And it's a really tough one when patients wholeheartedly believe one thing and the doctors wholeheartedly believe something else. So as a physician, how would you broach that? Um, so loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't have to say your opinion on it. Just how would you deal with the patient? <laughs> I, I think that from our discourse, actually, because I feel like I started out kind of as a non-believer, and then I reviewed, um, you know, the literature that you shared with me from the task force, and I immediately, after reading that article, realized that I believe one of my patients falls into that papulonodular category um, of steroid. Um, you know, withdrawal or steroid addiction. Um, and so, you know, I think doctors are scientists, um, they're, you know, medically minded. So I think good, strong literature is always, um, always helpful in that kind of situation. Um, but I also will err um, and say that um, self-diagnosis is not a good thing either. Um, I think that patients should hesitate from self-diagnosing um, and really hear out their physicians and their approach. And if their approach seems reasonable and it would give it a, you know, it would give it a try. And if you don't see the results that you want, um, consider seeing, you know, like a national eczema association provider, um, even if that means traveling to see that provider, um, because, you know, that, that's the kind of patient I see that's willing to travel because, um, you know, they've seen they've seen other people who maybe aren't eczema experts, and it's just a matter of seeing the right physician. Um, but yeah, I mean, steroid addiction is not something that's described in you know textbooks. They don't teach you in medical school about red skin syndrome, um, and you know, like from my perspective as um, more of like a cynical New Yorker, like <laughs> that, that's a fake diagnosis, but um, identifying symptoms of steroid addiction and steroid withdrawal, um, and then me tying that into my patients helps. So I, I mean, 
I, so I would exactly what you said, you know, if patients sincerely believe that they identify with those symptoms, share that article with your, um, you know, with your provider. And if you're not happy with the, the way you're being treated, then see someone else, get a second opinion, um, or, and see, you know, maybe a specialist, see an allergist, see a dermatologist, um, maybe instead of the pediatrician or the family medicine provider. Um, so that would be That's my yeah. yeah, it is a tough one. And um, I, I know from my perspective, I've, I've been on the other side of seeing the, the community, they have a pretty loud voice talking about topical steroids, um, withdrawal addiction. And um, the first time I heard your presentation in Denver was when I went, oh, there's this other really important piece that I think a lot of people are missing. And that is that contact derm mm -hmm. element. Right, and, and how important just patch testing is. irritation from products. I mean, even if patch testing is negative, like there are irritants out there. So yeah, yeah. So I hope everyone gets that and really understands that you know there's a few stops on the way before you want to jump to um, to these other diagnoses that there's no treatment for, <laughs> really, uh, other than just white knuckling it, which I don't think anyone wants to do. Um, so a couple more questions. Got three minutes left here, so I'll do one more. <laughs> um, hmm. So here's an interesting story. This individual has had contact dermatitis and atopic dermatitis for seven years on their face. Uh, they tried Dupixent, and it actually made their face worse, even though their body eczema improved. Uh, while they were on Dupixent, they started to get red itchy bumps on their face and a burning upper lip that they never had before. They've now been off Dupixent for six months. Um, so they're wondering if burning lips could be a contact dermatitis, or does it sound like that's something else that they should be exploring? I, I think that it would be really hard to give specific advice in this situation uh, without um, you know, knowing the whole story, seeing the rash. Um, it burning lips sounds like it could be a contact dermatitis, like a chelitis, um, but it's really hard to say because it sounds like this patient's pretty severe and yeah, for sure. But yeah. that is a symptom potentially. Burning <laughs> lips could be a contact. So I mean, yeah, if they're using it for testing or something, they can look into that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See if there's anything else we want to end on. Um, Um, a super basic question, but a really important one. You've mentioned it a, a bunch of times tonight. Um, what is a wet wrap and occlusion therapy? Can you just give a real basic what that is? Yes, I love that question. Um, so um, wet wrap um, is a form of occlusion therapy, but it's basically um, using topical steroids under occlusion. The skin is occluded. Um, so the way um, we typically perform it um, in our day program at National Jewish um, is using wet pajamas. Um, and it involves applying the topical steroid directly to the skin after a soaking bath in lukewarm water. Um, and there's an emphasis on not um, mixing or layering the topical steroid with moisturizer um, because that would dilute its efficacy. Um, and over that layer of steroid, applying a wet layer and then over that wet layer, applying a dry layer. Um, and then staying in that wetted treatment um, for a couple of hours or sleeping in it overnight. Um, so we um, do this um, as part of our skincare regimen for eczema patients, where it's done three times a day. Um, and it's pretty intensive and it's done under the guidance of our nurses. Um, but it's a way, um, to help the corticosteroid kind of penetrate into the skin better. 
um, by using the moisture in the skin um, from the bath. Um, and I know that this may contradict advice that other people have gotten before, um, where they say not to bathe often or bathe less often. Um, and that is a controversial, I've trained in allergy and dermatology area, you know, depending on which provider you see. Um, I think the most important thing, whether you bathe daily or bathe every other day, um, I'm in favor of daily baths, is to seal um, that moisture in when the skin is damp. So um, baths can be drying um, if you're allowing yourself to air dry, um, but if, if you seal in that moisture, um, you know, either with the steroid on inflamed skin or moisturizer on uninflamed skin, um, then it can actually be really beneficial to the skin. And um, I've seen some pretty incredible results um, with wet wipe therapy. Great. And for those who are interested in trying it, you certainly can fly to Denver uh, <laughs> and check out the program at National Jewish. We've heard many, many wonderful success stories of people that have gone through the program. Um, and had just phenomenal results. Um, but if you wanna try it at your own home, we do actually have some fact sheets on our website that are step-by-step -step, um, printable sheets that will walk you through both wet wraps and soak and seal. So both um, ends of the spectrum to go ahead and get that tried at home. Um, and of course the bathing and moisturizing tips are there as well. Uh, as Dr. Barr said, we, um, have seen time and time again that the bathing is actually good, but the key is lukewarm water, not too long, and moisturize after. Within three minutes is the dated time frame um, to get that moisture locked in. So yeah. it's a big one. All right, well, with that, we will close for the evening. I wanna thank Dr. Brewer again. That was just so wonderful, so helpful. I'm sure that that made a really big difference for a lot of people. Um, understanding why eczema is so challenging to diagnose and treat, uh, I think helps people know that maybe they're not crazy in their own frustration of trying to figure it out themselves when even the doctors can be challenged. Um, you can find many additional resources on our website at nationaleczema.org. And on behalf of Dr. Brar and the National Eczema Association, thank you all for attending the Diagnostic Treatment Challenges of Eczema webinar. We look forward to seeing you in future events and we will get this recording to you within the next few days. Thank you, Dr. Barr. Have a good evening. Thank you, my pleasure. Good night. Good night.